Welcome to My Life, Chassidus Applied, episode 464. This program is in loving memory of Miriam Basalio Altes, Allah HaShalom, upon her passing on 11th of Menachem month. It's also in Schus and Merit, Ibadl Lechaim Lechaim, Ben Chaim Lechaim, Baruch Ben Yamin Ben Menuchalana Altes, Yukasil Ben Lei Rochel and Rochel Basli Befarkash. Dedicated by Pinchas Tadris, Ben Miriam, and Sarah Bas Rachel Altes. Okay. So, we're ready into the second week of the month of El, which is the final month of the year called Chedesh HaCheshben, the month when we make an accounting, introspection, soul search of what has happened in the past year, and a Chedesh HaChana, one that prepares us for the new year. A new year is a new energy, new possibilities, new opportunities. So life is not a static, boring rut, but something that's constantly mobile, constantly being refreshed and renewed. And this is the month that's a bridge between the past and the future. So there's a lot to do. Every day of El is rich with content and rich with opportunity. And we use it out to the fullest. And the more we invest and put our energy in, the more the results and the blessings of Aksim Vachsim Ateva, a very blessed and sweet year, materially and spiritually, on good health and nachas from our families and our children, our grandchildren, and from everyone in the world. And hopefully, a year of Geula Amitis Vashlem. So, in the spirit of Chassidus Applied, let's begin, this week we'll begin with Pasha Kisove. And we'll talk a little more about Elul. We'll start with Kisove, living with the time. This week's Pasha Kisove. And uh, as the Alter Rebbe says, to live with the time, to live with the Pasha. What is its lessons for us? So Kisove is filled, like every Pasha, filled with many themes and many ideas. Let's begin with the one that's captured in the name of the chapter itself, Kisove Ela Oretz, talks about the mitzvah of Bikurim, the first fruit offering. And the lesson is very straightforward. The word Bikurim comes from the same word as Bechor, which means first, firstborn, the firstborn among humans, the firstborn among animals, the firstborn among the world of vegetation, it has something special because it's the first blessing that we receive, the firstborn. So what do we do? We recognize that we're not self-made human beings and we dedicate it. The first fruit we bring as an offering. Abchor, same idea, that's why we need a pidyan haben to redeem the firstborn. The firstborn is like the, in, in, in personal Aveda, the Rebbe brings that it's like saying moida ani in the morning, that as soon as you wake up, the first breaths you take, the first fresh new minutes, you dedicate to what? Moida ani lefanecha. It's a form of Bikurim, the first. The first thing I acknowledge, I thank you for returning my neshama, my soul to me. It's my soul to me. So it's the idea of recognizing right at the outset of any journey, the outset of any that thing that we embark on, to recognize where our blessings come from. So firstly, it's the basic, basic principle of gratitude. But it's also setting the stage and setting the tone. It's like the mission statement of a person's life is the beginning. So, so the first fruit tell us, as soon as you will arrive and you'll enter into the land, bring Bikurim, bring for the, for the fruit, the first fruit as an offering. And that sets the tone for the, what everything else you do is elevated, not just to be self-indulgent, but dedicated to, some higher, to a higher cause. The word Kisove also means to enter. The word sove, bia, is an entry. It's not just to arrive. Interesting contrast. Last week it was kiseitse. We went out to wage war. Because war you wage outside of yourself. Kisove laris means you're entering into the land in a primizdika way. Eretz Yisrael, Eretz HaKedosh, the holy land, the promised land. You're entering into it. And the, what better way to represent to entering into the land is then to dedicate what you're doing to a greater cause, not just to eat the fruit, but to bring it as an offering to God. 
which teaches all of us, everyone has the land that they enter. It could be your home, it could be the city, it could be your country, the place you, you dwell in. And that to recognize that right in the beginning, as soon as you dwell into something, always make a Chanukah Sabayis. You dedicate your home, you dedicate the beginning of something toward a higher cause. And it's a way of just essentially always recognizing that when you begin something properly, the rest follows in that same direction. That's a basic lesson in life, and it's a good lesson every day. So no matter what happens in your life, always recognize beginnings. Acknowledge them. Be humble. Bring the offering. Show that you're dedicating it somewhat to something that's not just your own interests, but the divine transcendent purposes. That's a very basic lesson from this week's Pasha. But there are more things on the Pasha that should be addressed. And let us begin with um, one of the things that jumps out at us. This is the Pasha of the Teichacha. The Teichacha is, of course, what's usually called in English curses, clawless, you know, opposite of blessings. So, yes, we have in Pasha B'chukesei, but in this Pasha is the, the bulk of them. So we have the story of the Alta Rebbe, the Mitla Rebbe, which really captures essentially the essence of this uh, parsha, and that's that uh, there was one, the Alter Rebbe used to read the Torah every week. One week he wasn't he wasn't there by the reading of the Torah. So the Balkeda, who was reading the Torah, came to the parsha of which you read quicker and quieter, you know, in a more of a subdued tone. And uh, when the Mitla Rebbe heard what he was reading, he fainted. He fainted because of the, the, the horrible clothes he was listening to, the curses, such terrible things that, 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 that he was hearing. Afterwards, they asked him, why did you faint? So he said, did you hear what we read? They said, but every year they read this, and you never faint. He says, when the Tata lent, when my father reads, only hear blessings. What does that mean? He reads the same verses. Because the verses are really deeper, they're blessings. But you have to know how to read it. You have to know how to read it. Av harachmim, when the father, Av harachmim, the father, the compassionate father. Which teaches us a tremendous lesson where you find, especially in Chassidus and the Maimorim, on these, uh, on these, on the Teichacha, that says that in life, since there's no evil that comes from above, everything is good. It's just a matter of what level of good. There's revealed good, and there's concealed good. Chsadim nustadim, or chsadim uchusim. Kindness that's concealed, and sometimes the deepest kindness is concealed because it can't be expressed with regular containers. So the truth is, these opposite of blessings really contain much deeper blessings. But in this world that Hashem made, where He concealed His presence and wants us to reveal that which is concealed, that's why it's concealed, and we have to reveal it. Someone asked the question, okay, fine. If the curse is proclaimed as the Jews walk between Mount Grizim and Mount Nevei, who are really blessings in disguise, why was the Alter Rebbe the only one to understand this? And when anyone else read the portion of the Torah, the Mitla Rebbe would tremble with fear. Basically, why was the Alter Rebbe the only one able to reveal the blessings hidden within these curses? Even me, a simple person, understands there's nothing bad in the Torah and everything from Hashem, from Hashem is a blessing. How could other big rabbis think these curses were really curses? Okay, very good question. So there's a similar episode that we find in the Gemara in Moed Kot, where Rajbi sends his son, Rabbi Lozer, to go for a blessing in the West by the, Chach, the Chachmei Mairiv, the wise sages in the West. <clears throat> and he goes for a blessing. When he arrives, he, they say things to him, and he's shocked. He's completely traumatized. He comes back to his father and says, they weren't blessings, they were curses. They cursed me. His father said, what do they tell you? And he repeats everything they said. And so, the father says, the truth is, they're all blessings. They just said it in the, gar- in the garments, in a language, the opposite. So here too, you could ask the same question. 
Why did the father, Rashim by Yechoi, see it? Abelaza, his son, didn't. And others may also have not seen it. What does he see that he didn't see? And why did they have to put it in those garments? Why couldn't they just say blessings? There's many ways to bless somebody without having to hide it in any cryptic language. So you have another story. Rabbi Akiva, at the end of Makis, where you have Rabbi Akiva with his colleagues are looking at the Harabais, the tragic Harabais after the destruction, the desolation. They saw Sho'olim Helchimbe. They see fox roaming like you know, in a, in a uh, desolate wilderness where it was once the Kedush Kadosh and the Holy of Holies. So Rabbi Akiva's colleagues began to cry. Rabbi Akiva smiled, laughed. Why are you crying? He said, look, it's the fulfillment of those te- terrible prophecies of the destruction of the temple. And why are you laughing? Why, what's, the, what's, the, what's the joy? He says, because I see the fulfillment of the continuing prophecy that once that will happen, it will lead to the rebuilding of the Beis Amigdash Ashlishi, and Geula, and so on. So they responded, Akiva Nechamtani, Akiva Nechamtani, Akiva, you've consoled us. Akiva, you've consoled us. So what's the difference? What did he see they didn't see? The answer is, different eyes see different things. You could be a tzaddik. But Rabbi Akiva went particularly through difficult times. Until he was 40 years old, he didn't learn Teir. You know the famous story. Some say he was a ger himself, a convert. Some say he was a ben ger, he was a child of converts. The name Akiva itself indicates Akiv, the heel. So the concealment, the level of concealment in a person. Most concealed energy is concealed there. So it says in Ovis the Rabnosin that Akiv is the Malchamovisha Ba'odam. A person has all parts of existence in microcosm within Elam Kotn Za Odam. The human being is a microcosm of the universe. So the Malachamovis. Why? Because the heel has so little sensation. That's why you can walk on the ground, doesn't feel it's, it's more. It's tougher, whereas other parts of the body are far more sensitive. <clears throat> so Dafka, a person who comes from that darker place, he's able to see the light within the darkness. Rajbi, the Megad, the Mara Primis Atela, the Mechaber Nigla and Primis, so the Primis within things. The Alter Rebbe, the Shama Chadosha, a new soul that brought down Chassidus Chabad, the Miyasad, the founder of Chassidus Chabad, sees the brachas even in the negative. And the rest of us learn from that. So there's, the, then the obvious question is, so why Taka does the to make it that way? So there are many reasons given for the story in Gemar Mayit Cotton. Some say because they saw that the destiny of Rabbi Lazar was to have some of these negative things. So they wanted to transform it, so they said it in a cryptic language that sounded like negative, but they used it in terms, as Rashbi interpreted, as positive blessings. But in Kutta Tere, B'chukesai, Samach Sadiq brings this Gemara, Moit Katan, there he explains, because it's deeper chsadim. So sometimes when you want to give someone a gift, you give it to them directly, and they see exactly the gift. Sometimes you want to give a deeper gift, that they can't yet appreciate, so you give it to them in a container that may seem the opposite. But in it lies even more potent, positive energy. And it's our mission, and that's part of the mission of our lives. Why is, why is, why is life so difficult? Because the goal is for us to reveal the deeper good within everything. That's the, why, the reason it happens. So there are those individuals that teach us, Rabbi Akiva, Rajbi, al and once we learn from it, then we can discover how to transform it. By recognizing and not being deceived by the externals and realizing there's some deeper blessing in this. Seeing the larger narrative. Right now it may look negative, but if you look at the bigger picture, if you look deeper, you'll find the deep beauty in it, the deep blessing in it. So obviously we pray that we should only have teva nirva nigla, everything should be revealed good. But even when something comes our way that may not seem that way, realize it's real good. And when trach good, when zayin good, you actually open up that deeper teva hanelam, the chesed hanelam that's concealed there, and it comes out with full force, with even more intensity than chesed, regular chesed, regular kindness. Which brings us to the next question, where somebody asks, 
So what are hidden blessings and how do we reveal them? So I believe I just answered the question. What are hidden blessings? Hidden blessings means the things that are more in potential state. You know, many people are blessed with gifts and you see them very obvious. You know, everybody has their skills. But we all also have cheiches and alamim, hidden faculties, concealed skills and talents. And how do we reveal them? Through pressure. When you're forced, when you're pressured. Zayish, ain't in meitzah shamni, an olive does not produce oil until you press it. To the extent that Rebbe Rashab says, it's hard to say this, but you could say Yutas Kislev, the Alter Rebbe being in Petersburg, in prison, was a form of an olive being pressed. And then he began to produce oil on a whole different level. The chassidus that came out after the arrest and the liberation. So it's life's pressures, the difficulties, the resistance that brings out these deeper strengths. And you see that all the time when you're challenged, when there's some resistance, when there's some impediment, it forces you to dig deeper to get beyond that impediment. Again, we should all be blessed with the least amount of pressure. But life is always going to have some pressure. And that's how you reveal the deeper strengths. Chassidus brings the example that there is the difference between a, a hot coal, shalhevas kshuda begacheles. So the flame in a hot coal, so the white coal, you don't see the flame. Because it's concealed, but it's there. And then you have the sparks of flame, the sparks, of, the sparks that can build a flame within a flintstone. So Chassidus and Samachvav and other places talks about that they both reveal a helm. One is a helm she'yesh nebemitzis, one is a helm she'ein nebemitzis. So the coal, you don't see it the naked eye, but you put your hand close to it, you could feel the heat. You definitely don't want to touch it. And if you fan it, you suddenly see you can bring it alive. You put it into water, it'll extinguish the coal. Even though it appears white, and we don't know whether it's a lit. A flintstone, you can put the flintstone in water, you can touch it, and nothing. How do you get this? How do you get the sparks out? You have to strike it hard. With a flint with a coal, all you have to do is fan it. So one reveals the coal, reveals a helam, something concealed within us. It's not revealed, but it's not something that's distant from being revealed. It's a helam, sheyeshnu It means it's a concealment, but it's it's there. It's just you don't see it yet. So you have to open the door. And how do you open the door? You fan it. But then there's a helam shenim emitzis. It's a whole new super conscious state. A new type of energy. And there you need real pressure. There you need to strike it. And when you strike it, the, star- the sparks fly out. So it's different levels of what we can, what we can reveal. And that's how life works. That's the lessons we learn from all these ideas. Now the fact of the matter is, some of these negative things, unfortunately, were fulfilled. Because it says, if you will not do what Hashem wants, what will happen? It's, it's called cause and effect. There are consequences. But even then, we have to realize, even the negative, whether it's our own behavior or the consequences that came from it, is meant to lead us to a greater place. So after everything that happens in Golis, and everything we've gone through, there'll be the time when Mashiach and Gula will come. Eit Hashem ki be that we'll be able to thank God for what we've, the afflictions that we experienced. We'll see the deeper good in it all. So that's some of the lessons that we learn from it, and it's very relevant to all of us in our lives, that there are things that will happen that may not appear initially to be positive. Think of it as a pressure that's putting, forcing you to dig deeper and come up with greater strengths, be more creative. And when you overcome it, you become stronger and more powerful. As the Jews were afflicted, in direct proportion to that, they flourished and they thrived. Okay. So later in the Pasha, at the end of the Pasha, we learn <clears throat> about the, now it's at the end of the 40 years, remember the whole Sefer Dvarim is Meisha speaking, the last 37 days of his life, from Rishchei Dishvat, Till Zion Adar. He's giving us like his last will and testament. 
So one of the things Moshe says is now that we've come 40 years after traveling through this wilderness, now you come to a point, it's until this point where it says that the, the words he uses to quote exactly is that now you've achieved lev ladas and naim lides vez naim l'shmoya. Till now, you not really have the eyes to, a heart to know, eyes to see, and, hear, and ears to hear. And as the commentaries explain, and the Gemara explains, because until 40 years, by 14, 40 years, you reach a level of maturity where now you can appreciate things that you could not appreciate earlier years. There's two opinions whether 40 means reaching age 40 or 40 years from when you first experienced or heard this beautiful sikha from the Rebbe in Tov Shenun, Yud Shvat, it's 40 years from the Rebbe's in the leadership. And he talks about that 40 years, even though some people were not around in Tov Shin Yud in 1950, but since there were people there, like by Mitzrayim, not everybody was there when they left Mitzrayim. There were children born afterwards. But since there were people there, <coughs> therefore they can teach whatever they learned over those 40 years. So the question was asked, what is the meaning of the verse that only after 40 years do people achieve the heart to know, eyes to see, and ears to hear? So the first thing, as I said, it's a level on a student learning by a teacher. So you learn things that are revealed. Talk about revealed and concealed. But how much is concealed in what you've learned? You've been five years old, you learned that a teacher, or 10 years old, whatever the age is. As you mature and grow and your channels and your containers expand, you start realizing, ah, that's what my teacher meant. And by age 40, the real Helam, even the Helam Shein of or Helam Sheyeshtim of is revealed. That's what happens over time. A person can reach that place. Chassidus brings this, Samach Vov, right, the beginning, to explain, since before the Tzimtzum, there was Eden Sof, the divine consciousness filled everything, then God concealed it, and now the Aveda is to reveal it again, what's the Chiddush? It was already revealed before. So through Avayda, what, what, what do we achieve? The Tzimtzum? And then we just go back to what it was before the Tzimtzum. So he gives two, two answers. The first answer, he says, no. The Tzimtzum allowed another consciousness with Kalim to be able to now appreciate it. Before the Tzimtzum, it didn't leave room for anything else. Now we leave room for some another entity, reality, existence. And existence now can appreciate the Eir Lifnat Simpson. That's a Chiddush. And Koy Inish, a Daita the Rab. That even a student, a beginner, now has reached a level that he can appreciate the divine, the unadulterated, the undiluted divine consciousness, seamless pre Simpson. Second explanation he gives is that, even more than that, that he actually surpasses, and you could be Megala, new Eir that wasn't even there before the Simpson from the source, which is the theme of, of Samach Vav as he continues discussing it. What's relevant here is the Koy Inu Shaddai that another entity, your student, not just you, your child, your student, can reach that same level on their terms. Okay, another question in that context. <clears throat> is there a connection between this concept and the suggestion that one should wait until age of 40, the age of 40 before learning Kabbalah. Well, it is, there is. The source about learning Kabbalah before age 40 is from, the, is from different places, but the Shach, the shach it's just on Yeri Deya, Reish Mem Vov Vov, Sima Reish Mem Vov Si Vov, he talks about it, and he says, loosely translated, there are those that say that one should wait until the age of 40 before learning Kabbalah, for it says in the Mishnah, 40 is the age of wisdom. Ben Arboim Labina, age of understanding. Ben Arboim Labina, which is connected to a couple of the 40 Koyinu Shaddai to the Rab. From there it's Mashmah 40, the age of 40, not 40 years from when you learn the topic. Rebbe spoke about it at length, then Tov Shenun, also in Tov Shen Chav Zayin was 40 years from Yudbeis Tammuz, the Rebbe also discussed this idea. 
So is there a connection? There is a connection. But the first qualification has to be, what does it mean to learn Kabbalah? When we say, We say it with our children, that's not learning Kabbalah, that's Aleph Beis of Yiddishkeit, that you have an Neshama. I was once giving a class and someone said to me, how could you teach Kabbalah to people who are under 40? So I said, did you ever learn Kabbalah? He said, no. So I said, how do you know I'm teaching Kabbalah then? Sounds like it. I said, I'm teaching olive bays. Olive bays. You have children? Yeah. You say with them, and they ask you, Where's, what's a neshama? Where did the neshama come from? What do you mean it's being returned from me? Where did it go? You're going to tell them, and I'll tell you in 40 years from now. It's the olive bays. Kabbalah? Talk about Kabbalah, the, the pure Kabbalah and the Zayar and so on. Then, of course, even more than that, we have once the Rabbi uh, said, Mitzvah legal is Zesa Chachma. And now as the time has come, as we get closer to Mashiach, to reveal this Chachma, Kabbalah, and Rabbi Chaim Vital elaborates in his introduction to Yitzchayim, the importance of it. And then the Baal Shem Tov hears from Mashiach, Futsamay Nesecha Chutzah, that will bring Mashiach. And then with the an advent with Chassidus, the Magid and the Alter Rebbe, Chassidus Chabad, today is a different world because also as the famous example of the Alter Rebbe, the child, the ill child, to save a child, you give everything. You give even the most precious stone, which is the Kabbalah, Primus Sater. But however you explain it, the, with the point of 40 was not to prohibit learning Tater, to appreciate it. But today we also have what we learn from our teachers, and it may take 40 years for a person to fully appreciate what they're learning. It's not just about a, it's not just about, about a prohibition. It's an understanding of certain maturity that you reach at 40. Okay. Relevant to us is, the bottom line is, we've gone past 40 years already, 40 years from when Eden left Mitzrayim, 40 years from the Rebbe's Nesias, even more than that, many more years from the older Rabbeim, so we've already been saturated and been matured to the point that we are ready to koi inu shadayt of the rabbi, imolo oriz deyes Hashem kamayim layom mechasim. Filling the world with tasis Hashem, dayt of the rabbi, like the waters fill the sea. Our job is to finish spreading chsidis, reaching as many people as we can, tipping the scales, the tipping point, and ultimately the eruption of the gula mitzvah v'ashleim, the emergence after all the work that has been done, now comes the last step to reveal it all. And with that, let's segue right into Chedesh El. So El, can you provide a short synopsis of the Mamorim that speak about El? So, yes, there are Mamorim. We begin with the Mamor I've been discussing in the last few weeks since El began. Famous Maimer, Anila Deidi Vedeidi Li, Harei B'Sheshanim, in Lukut Tera, the Moshe of Melech Basada, the king in the field, and basically explaining that we have the revelation of the 13 attributes of divine compassion, but now in the field. The king is in the field. We have it in our mundane lives, and everyone can come over to God and ask for everything they want, and Hashem grants it with a smile. Everyone has that access. So that's one central theme, especially one that the Rebbe talks so much. It's from the Kutte Teire, Pasha Re'e, in that Maimer. There's a Maimer from the Alta, from the Friedrich Rebbe, in Tavshin, that discusses it and adds different emphases. So that's one central theme. Yud Gimel Midas Sarach. Anila Deidi Vedeidi Li is the predominant theme of El in the Maimarim. It's an acronym. Anila Deidi Vedeidi Li is El. Harei B'Sheshanim is explained in Chassidus. Another theme is Shashanim has two explanations. Shashanim means, the, I, come, I am my beloved, my, my beloved is to me, grazes, who grazes among the roses, Shashanim. Shashanim has the meaning of Torah, Shashanim Bahalachis, the learning Torah, and Shashanim from the, the Yud Gimel, the Yud Gimel, all in the Yud Gimel leaves the 13 petals of the Shashanim, which corresponds to Davenik. So you have the Aveda of Teira and Tefillah from, from the top down and from the bottom up in this month to both conclude the year and prepare us for the next year. Another theme. A third theme you find, you say from Amari Midish and other places, <coughs> that, is the <coughs> that is the last month of the year, Chedesh <coughs> HaCheshbun, 
time to make an accounting, soul search, introspection of everything we did in the past year. And the second, that is Chayit HaShachana. It's also a preparation for the new year. And they go hand in hand. Think of an example in business. There comes a time you make an accounting of all the, all the, all the transactions, everything you did, and all the activities till this point, and then you prepare. What's our plan for the next year? So that's yet another theme of El. So there's a number, number of themes, and more than that as well. Actually, in the book 60 Days that I um, wrote, which many people use these days because it's essentially like a journal that goes through every day of El, I bring many other themes of El, some straight from my modem, some from other Svarim. So El is rich with all kinds of ideas, but let's go back to Yud Gimel Midas Arach, which will reveal to Moshe when he's on the mountain during this time, praying to Hashem for forgiveness. So it's a time that we emulate as well in our praying for forgiveness. By Svardim, they say slichas from the beginning of the month. The rest of it say in the last week, depending on the schedule, but week before Rosh Hashanah. So special prayers, all preparing us for a new year, new brachas, new opportunities, new possibilities. Another question, what is it about the energy of the month of El that is aligned with the teachings of the Baal and the Alter Rebbe, who were born a Chayel, which infuses vitality into this month. So the question essentially is, we know the birthday of the Baal Shem Tov, Shnei Ma'eris Agdeim, the two great luminaries, the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Chassidus in general, Chassidus Aklolis, and the Alter Rebbe, the founder of Chassidus Chabad, both born a Chayel. A Chayel also means bring a Chayis into El. So it's not just coincidence, God forbid. What's the connection? So there's a beautiful sicha, among many things you could probably say, a beautiful sicha in Tov Shem Mem 1987. Shabbos Pasha Sove was Chayel that year. And the Rebbe explains exactly this idea. Anila Dei Dividei Dili is two phrases. I am to my beloved. That means you generate. Aveda Bekei Chatzmi, Aveda Momata Lamayim. The Deidi Li and my beloved is to me, no mail lamata. In the language of Chsidis, Asusa de Lotata, Asusa de Leela. The awakening stimulation from below, Anila Deidi, the Deidi Li. There's another possible, the Deidi Li, Vaniloi, that refers to Nisan. There it starts with Hamshacha, no mail lamata. The Ebesh, the Nigla Kveda, Nigla, the Nigla. That it was a revelation from above, and then came the initiative from below. But El goes Mamatalamai. Okay. <clears throat> but there's both elements. The Rebbe explains that's the difference between Baal Shem Tov and the Alter Rebbe. Baal Shem Tov was Baal Shem Skan Hogis. Miraculous behavior. It was Machatchila Riber. It was Mamayla Lamata. The Alter Rebbe was more Mamatalamayla. In Teva. In asogi, in understanding, mipsari exalika, from my flesh I behold God, to show through seichel to understand godliness. That godliness is also manifest in seichel, and you need the joining of both of them. That's why they come together. Chayel, you need the joining of both because you want to have the revelation from a higher place, but you want it integrated and internalized. So Anila Dei David Dei Dili is essentially its essence captured by the Baal Shem Tov and the, the Alter Rebbe. Now once you have the Alter Rebbe, obviously, we go Mamat Lamayla, you start with Aveda step by step. First you say Bechol Avavcha, then Bechol Navshcha, then Bechol Meidercha. But you still need a joining of both. So that's one explanation of understanding the connection. There are, I'm sure, definitely other connections. El is the last month of the year, beginning of the new year. The Baal Shem Tov and the Alter Rebbe taught us how to serve Hashem. The expression is the, Alter, the Baal Shem Tov showed that every Jew could serve Hashem. And the Alter Rebbe showed how every Jew can serve Hashem. One of the examples given is the Alter Rebbe, the Baal Shem Tov provided a ladder to heaven. And the Alter Rebbe showed how to climb the ladder. So El is a month of Aveda. In all the five Kavim, Teir, Aveda, Mils, Chasadim, Tshuva, and Geula, all alluded to in the acronym of Alav Lamad Bav Lamar of El. Okay. So then, a Chayel, it infuses Chayes in El, like Primi Satay, it infuses 
energy, like a neshama, neshmasa daraisa, what does it do to a body? It brings it alive. So primis atera, the Alter Rebbe, the Mit, the Bel Shem Tov, the Alter Rebbe, bring alive El. So Chayel is bringing Chayes into El. A few other El-related questions. Since we are in the weeks adding, uh, leading up to Rosh Hashanah, can we please ask Rabbi Jacobson to discuss what is tshuva? What is required of us to do tshuva, and what are the methods of doing tshuva? What are the different levels and stages of tshuva? So essentially the question is, what is tshuva? So tshuva, the word itself, very interesting word. Tshuva means return. Most people translate it as repent. Repent is actually the opposite of return. Repent means that you're repenting of something you did. Return means you're going back to who you were originally. Teaching us that fundamentally we're pure people. Your soul is pure. Chele kele mamish. Mamal mamish. It's a piece of the divine. Created in the divine image. However, we sometimes wander off, God forbid. But wandering off doesn't change who you are. So tshuva is getting back to the original place, realigning yourself to your quintessential self. So that's the meaning of tshuva. Is there an element of repentance? Yes, because sometimes you have to clean up the dust. Because if you're covered with dust, it's hard to go back. It's like if your house, a clean, beautiful house, got dirty, you have to clean up the house if you want to go back to what original pristine form it was in before. That's why we have two types of tshuva. Tshuva tata and tshuva ilah. Tshuva tata is the cleaning up. Asking for forgiveness for those you've hurt. Remorse. Charot Allah over Kabbalah Teva Allah Haba. Remorse over things you may have done wrong. Making a strong resolution not to do it again. Improving our ways. The accountability. So you're cleaning up your act. You're cleaning out the dust from your life. Then comes Tshuva Ilah. Tshuva Ilah is not the dust cleaning. Now it's Ruach HaToshev El Elikim In the language of the Alt of the Rabbeim. Leikatos Elam. It's not like the mistake of the Elam from the word Helam Behester, of the concealed world, that Tshuva is on a sin. Tshuva is reconnecting, returning to Ruach HaToshev El Elikim the spirit returning to its source. You need Tshuva Tata to clean out the dust. You don't bring new furniture into a home. If you don't first clean out the dust. But then comes the main tshuva, tshuva ilah. Explained in ta, in ta'ina, get us a tshuva. Sometimes we talk about el tshuva tata, and the yom neroyim, roshon yom kippur tshuva ilah, this tshuva ilah in el itself. It's many, many levels, it's all relative. The truth is we have to have both all the time. Call yom of tshuva. So tshuva is really a lifetime process is the idea of constantly perfecting yourself, constantly improving. And we all know we could always improve. The question is, are you improving going from the negative to the positive, or from the positive to the better? All this is included in tshuva, which, of course, in the month of El. The truth is all year round, call Yom Abba tshuva, as I said. But there are times, the ace, like the Rambam Paskins, there are times it's more opportune, more auspicious time. From El, we go into, into Rosh Hashanah, then Aser Simei tshuva. We say, Then there are even less layers and we can get closer. But ultimately it's about connecting to your source. Connecting to who you really are. To do that, you need to clean up. You have to weed the garden. You can't just say, I'll plant flowers. You have to make sure there aren't toxic and negative forces, destructive forces impeding the way. So you need to deal with both sides. Surmara and Asetev. That's a short summary to answer your question about tshuva. Is there a way for us to know when our tshuva is complete and if Hashem has accepted our tshuva and given us a fresh start? We always have to have the confidence that our tshuva is going to be complete. The Tur Paskins, why do we wear white when we go to Rosh Hashanah? White is only those that were innocent are wear white. Because we know Eza Mikai Godl who is like Mikam Chisor, Migoy Godel? Who knows who's like a nation like Israel? They know Ufyashal, the Ufyashal Umazu, the personality of this nation, knows the personality of God. And we know for sure, confident, that God is, is forgiving us. So that's our attitude. That doesn't mean we're off the hook. 
means we have to do everything possible, but we go with a confidence because again, we're returning to ourselves. It's not just, oh, okay, I'm no longer a good person, I've become bad, so is God going to accept me or not? If you're returning to yourself, God has created you. He knows that you, He created you, B'Tselem Melekim. Now you're accessing it, so we're confident that the tshuva will be accepted. Can you for sure know exactly what happens above? I don't know if we have to know, I don't know if we're told. The most important thing is we're confident, we bench each other, and we, that Hashem will bench us with a good year, and that's the best way of knowing. <clears throat> but we don't necessarily have to be told exactly what this isn't necessarily something you gauge in that way. So we go with the attitude that for sure Hashem will accept it. Ayftiche Teir the Rambam says, "Besev Galusa and Yisrael Eishin Shuvah Miyadei Negol." That for sure they'll do Shuvah. How do we know? Because that's their nature. We're going back to who we are. It's not superimposed. It's not unnatural. It's not acquired. It's who we inherently are. That we may have wandered off for a moment, God forbid. And Miyadei Negol, and then we'll be immediately redeemed. Okay. Covered the timely things. Let's talk about time, meaning the Parsha and Elul. Let's talk about some timely things, some events that are going on. So someone asked the question about the turmoil in Israel over judicial reform. Someone asked, what is the Chabad's view of Israeli judicial reform and the turmoil it's causing in Israel? So let's first talk about the very turmoil and then we'll talk about the reform. The Chabad view is the Torah view. And what is that? We're all one people. God blesses us as we stand together. In Tanya chapter 11, chapter love, Pedic Lamed Beis 32, he elaborates that we're all Avecha Lukolona, Kula Masimas, Miya Deg Dulas and Malosa. So the attitude is every Jew is our brother and sister. So regardless of opinion, regardless of knowledge, regardless of their disposition, regardless of their so-called choices, that's the bottom line. Anything that in any way creates a rift between brothers and sisters, we have to do everything to mend. We'll talk about disagreements in a moment. But that has to be the core issue. And that has to be the core goal. So it's tragic. It makes you cry, more than cry, to see such divisiveness, such even, I, I don't want to use the word hatred, but literally, like, in both directions. It just de de demonstrates that we're lacking, like, the foundational element of everything. If this was actually your brother and sister, would that be the attitude? So that means we don't feel it's our brother and sister. So like the Rishalmi says, we're all parts of one body, organs of one body, the right arm, the left arm. Can one hit the other? Can one not dislike the other? It's part of the same. If you dislike that part, you're disliking yourself. So our approach has to be, and I say our, I mean all of us, total love. I've said this many times, the best preemptive medicine, if every Shem Shab is Jew in Israel, for that matter, anywhere in the world, would invite their neighbors that are le'isata, not publicly keeping Shabbos, you change the whole landscape of the country, of the world. That's how it should be our attitude. What connects us is much deeper than what separates us. We're the Jewish people. We're one nation, one, one family. You can disagree with your brother or sister, but you never. the love is always deeper than that. That's what we should be yelling in the streets. That's what all the demonstrations should be. Where's the love? Now regarding the Atzim Inyan, so first of all, no matter what the disagreement's about, whether it has a basis, whether it's based on anything or not, disagreement should never be more powerful than, as I said, what connects us. But let's say disagreement even has merit. Even if it does. That's not the, that's not the primary thing. There's ways to work it out. Now it's true. Both sides, it takes two to tango, can end up inciting each other and digging in and it's becoming political power who's in control and that's a problem that's why I look at those that know more have to be the ones that are more responsible that doesn't mean you have to compromise it means but the attitude has to be I'm, I'm here I love you 
I'm not coming to impose upon you my laws, my authority. As far as the judicial issue goes, I don't know the details well enough to be able to even weigh in what's right, what's wrong. There seems to be a strong argument that the judiciary, judiciary department is its own entity, has, has somewhat, of a, somewhat of a disproportionate amount of control. But this is not necessarily an issue purely between religious and not religious. That should be addressed in a maybe a public forum in some form or not. I'm not going to weigh in on that. But like every political issue needs to be addressed. And why shouldn't all the sides be able to voice their opinions and come away with some consensus or some type of understanding? But I want to address mostly the divisiveness that's resulting. That's the painful part. That's the part that, that I can speak about. The part that I have a say, I can say something about. <clears throat> But of course, when you deal with politics and we deal with money and power, all kinds of things happen that are distortions. And that only tends to further corrupt all the issues. And then it's not even religion. People, most people, not religious people, will say the religious are corrupt. They want money. They want control. That's how they see it. They don't see they want, that's what God wants. So it's a time for us to teach what God wants, not whether it's a group. And, and religion can end up being a bureaucracy and it could be a corrupt bureaucracy as well. The first to acknowledge it. But it goes in all directions. So there's a lot more to say in it, but this is just a general view, especially the focus on the Abbas and Ahlus Yisro. And most important, the focus on teaching what is really God. I think everyone understood what God really was. Like the Levi Yisro said to the self-proclaimed atheist, the God you don't believe in, I also don't believe in. If we really knew what Hashem was, and the love of Hashem, and Rosh Hashanah coming, month of El, compassion, that would also change things. That's why I'm saying, going back to inviting your neighbor for Shabbos. And we need education here. We need inspiration. We need love. That's what's needed more than anything. And the politics, let the people who are political, let them fight it out, let them figure it out, like any issue in politics. Let's put it this way. If the judiciary was one way or the other, that's not going to resolve the Avas Yisrael issue until we address the core issue of how we trust or don't trust each other. There'll always be other topics that will come up. So the most important thing is to get the family together again. I'm not saying it's simple, but I have to state what I believe and what I think is our approach. When I say our, I mean Torah approach, Chabad approach, whatever name you want to give it. I don't like labels. So I think this is a healthy approach for all human beings, frankly. I don't see it as a Chabad approach. I see it as the right approach, period. Okay. Now, a few questions that somewhat may be fitting for Elo people looking at different things they have to correct in their lives. So the next question I'm going to address is this. Missed fill and due to illness. Someone asks, what can I do about missing a day of putting on fill and due to illness? Dear Rabbi Jacobson, yesterday I wasn't feeling well with a very bad, bad flu symptoms. I usually go to shul for shachas, but I thought it was a bad idea in case I was contagious. My plan was to go back to bed and rest and put on my tefillin at home later in the day when I was feeling better. But my symptoms worsened and one thing led to another and it wasn't until the evening when it was too late that I realized I forgot to put on tefillin. This was the first time in many years that I missed a day of tefillin. I know that I didn't do it on purpose and after my 180th birthday when I'm judged in the heavenly court, they will find me not guilty due to the circumstances. But I still feel very bad about this mistake. I may, I may not be the most religious person according to community standards, and I admit I still don't completely understand the significance of why we wear tefillin. But I know that it's something our ancestors have been doing for thousands of years, and it's one of the things I do proudly to show, I do to proudly show my love to my Jewish heritage. So what are some practical things I could do to make up for this accidental missed day of putting on tefillin? Thank you. So, I don't recall hearing specifically about this from the Rebbe, but I do know a similar incident. And if somebody has something that they've seen or heard from the Rebbe on this top of this question, please share and I'll share it on this program for the benefit of the public. But I do know someone had the issue with kosher. They had accepted eating kosher and mistakenly went to the wrong restaurant. I'm not sure exactly the details, but ended up not eating something kosher. They asked the Rebbe what to do. So the Rebbe said two things. First, 
we talked before, the digger, you, you dig deeper when there's something negative. That from now on, you take up even a bigger resolution to be very careful. But then the Rebbe said, Tikkun is to influence another person who doesn't eat kosher to start eating kosher. It's like he says in Tanya, Geras HaTshuva, I'm explaining. That when you do tshuva, it's like, an, it's like a rope. When the rope is severed, so it's severed. But when you tie it together, you tie it even stronger than it was in the first place. Like a double knot. That's tshuva. So you don't just do, you go back to, back to square one. You don't just repair. You repair it in a way that should never happen again. And one of the ways is to double your efforts. So someone who learns something, Misha Shena, Pirke, doubles their learning. So I would suggest influencing someone else to put on film on every day. So something came out of your lapse in turn turned into getting someone else to put on. In addition, to, obviously, to your own commitment and more stringency regarding this. That's what comes to mind as a re- approach to this, which is the essence of what tshuva is, not just not to do it again, but to do it now stronger and also influence others. Okay. Another question, which is like this. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, if I'm going to be traveling to a small, up, small upstate town that doesn't have any known Jewish people residing there, should I put on my tefillin at home in Brooklyn, or should I wait until I get to this small town and do it there in order to give the land the opportunity to be elevated by having someone do a mitzvah there which might not normally occur there? Okay, interesting question. Look, we're not talking here about Zman Krishma or anything time-wise. That you do, obviously, in the right time, you don't wait. But if you're talking about, and you know for sure, you can put on tefillin in the right time, there is a svara to say maybe that way you should do. Or, another suggestion, put on tefillin and daven where you are, at home, and maybe put on Rabbein Atam, upstate, wherever you're going. Another, another approach is maybe the davening you should do all at home. And when you go upstate, there's other mitzvahs you could do. It doesn't have to be dafka tefillin. I don't know if there's a black and white answer. But the point is, I think you have to do what's most practical and make sure nothing is compromised. Because even for the name of refining that place that may not have the Mitzvah film being done there right now, which is not even necessarily correct, but let's just say that's the case, who says it has to be film? It could be a different Mitzvah. And you don't want to in any way say that's more important than doing everything in time. And especially if there's Chshaz, God forbid, that you may miss it, you may forget. So I would take all that into account and I gave several options. And there's many myths. Definitely when you come there, that's for sure. God leads the footsteps of a person. You have to do whatever you can to do mitzvahs and refine. And the whole world, that whole part of the world is waiting for you to come there to make a bracha. Like the famous story with Abchaim Rappaport with the Baal Shem Tov. So you have to make a bracha. That for sure you should do. And the more mitzvahs you do, the better it is. And the more you do it publicly, even better. Like the Rebbe explained that sometimes you come to a city, just the mere fact they see a guy with tzitzis, with a beard, with a yarmulke. That alone is already a kiddush Hashem. So everything you can do, obviously, needs to be done. And I wouldn't just limit it to just film. Also, to film, you're probably not going to put it on the street. So to film may not even be seen. Maybe something you could do that would be more demonstrative. Obviously, not in an offensive way, but in a way that is a kiddush Hashem. Okay. Good. Let us now go to some follow-up. So I have plenty of follow-up to deal with. Let's first start with viewer discretion advised, a topic we've been talking about in the last few weeks. Unfortunately, it's the topic that is that exists, so we address it. This t- show, I made it clear, this program, nothing's taboo, everything's addressed, especially matters that really matter and are in the gay and nefesh, and sometimes life and death even, for many of us, we should only know good things. But this is one of the challenges of our time, and that is dealing with different, how to address different sexual orientations and identities. Should I reveal to my spouse my inclinations even if I don't act on them? Dear Rabbi Jacobson, I was inspired to write to you after you read a letter from a mother trying to come to grips with her teenage son who admitted he feels like he is gay. I am a religious married man in the community and I've been suppressing and hiding a secret that I have feelings that I am gay. I know the Torah prohibits homosexuality so I never actually have intimacy 
with the same gender, but I do fantasize about it. I don't think I am violating halacha because I don't commit the actual act. For comparison, it's not against halacha to look in the window of a non-kosher restaurant and think that the food looks good. It's only in Aver if you go inside the restaurant and actually eat the tray food. I care about my wife, but only as a friend, and I'm not attracted to her. When I go to mikvah, I enjoy looking. Well, I don't want to read it out loud. And when I'm intimate with my wife, I close my eyes and sometimes fantasize not the right things. I think I'm a good husband and father, generally speaking. But since I have not spoken to my wife about my feelings, I feel guilty that I'm being dishonest. To be frank, I'm satisfied with the status quo, but I'm afraid if I tell my wife the truth, it will hurt her and destroy my family, and I do not want to hurt my wife or my kids. Should I continue living this lie and maintaining the shalom bias, or should I sit down with my wife and tell her the truth and risk that the truth will cause pain and might destroy my family? Well, without knowing more details than what you've written, I will say unequivocally my opinion is that you should not share anything, especially that you're not acting on it. And I'll give you a third option. Not to be satisfied with the status quo, to find a good mashpia to speak about with. There are people that can help. I'm not saying we can make anybody perfect. I'm not saying that anybody will be perfect. But there are many things. The fact that you're writing about it, that you care, tells me that you could always be better. And I don't see any reason why you cannot develop more attraction to your wife in a holy, sacred way. The fact that you say it's halachically not permit, per- prohibited, well, machshava zara is a machshava zara. Bad thought's a bad thought. I understand that, that quite, you compared it to the, the restaurant. But, you know, look in Tanya, it talks about hiruri aveda, koshim aveda. It contaminates your mind. It's, not, it's also not exactly uh, preferable. Is it an actual aveda as in the chemer of an actual act, it doesn't have that, but it has other elements that are more toxic because it consumes you. You fantasize about it. I'm not saying this to be accusatory. I'm just saying let's not minimize that. So I would suggest finding a good mashpia. Second thing I suggest, let's start a heavy dose of chassidus, especially in the month of El. Get your mind into elokus. So firstly, just by thinking about godliness, you think less about other things. Secondly, that alone starts draining some of the energy that's going in the wrong place. And thirdly, it could actually help you develop more of the emotional, healthy emotions towards your spouse instead of going in the wrong direction. So this is not accusation. This is not, make, it's not meant to be judgmental at all. On the contrary, it's advice, a friendly advice out of coming from love that you could, you could improve. Don't be satisfied with the status quo. We're a month of L. That's not what we are. We're human beings. We're supposed to be growing. We're not stuck. No one's stuck, God forbid. So you can do things. A month that has opportunities. You'd give me the sadachim. You have to open yourself up to these energies. And it could create change. Again, I'm not looking cold turkey. I'm not looking for perfection here. We're looking for growth. More awareness. More sensitivity. Just from the tone, the fact that you're writing, I feel that there's an openness to that. And I really am very confident that you can get there. But it's going to take work. Nothing comes automatically because it's easy to just wander with your mind wherever you're wandering. So I'm glad to hear that you're not acting on it. That's, of course, great. But it can, go, it can get even better. Why be satisfied just the stopping b'mu'at? Why be satisfied with the minimum where you can get much more? And you're not coming alone. Habola tayr mesayinese. When you do something, you make effort, God responds. Anila deidi v'deidi li. We believe this. We really actually believe this. And it works. So why not, why not invoke that? Why not access that in helping you in your life? And I say this not just to you, to anyone else that have similar questions or similar challenges. Don't be satisfied with the status quo. No. You can expect much more from yourself. The enormous potential that, and potency that you have within you, no one has any clue how deep and how strong and powerful it is. As the Baal Shemta, the Baal of Yemeladis of Chayel says, Every it is Eretz Chefetz. It's a very desirable, a rich land filled with precious stones and, and valuables and, and, and most, the most uh, valuable, most cherished things. So why not access it? Be the best you can be. Okay. Another question in this regard. Dear Rabbi Jacobs, I listened to your answer about 
gender and about the same gender and thought your comments were spot on. I have two questions. Re your comparison between someone who's gay versus someone who can't be monogamous. So I spoke about that, uh, you know, we have problems not just in the area of uh, homosexuality, also in heterosexuality. So I made a comparison that everybody needs to discipline themselves. So the person writes, a man who can't be monogamous hurts a woman. A gay man doesn't hurt a single fellow being. It's between him and Hashem. So first of all, what about a single man? Can't be monogamous. So who is he hurting? So he's hurting. Yes, every woman he's with, obviously, God forbid. So that's number one. Number two, it's not just, besides the fact that also hurting yourself is also not allowed. You're not allowed to mutilate yourself. So let's not minimize that. Hurting yourself is also bad. But a person who is gay and is acting out with people, God forbid, he's going to hurt somebody. Not just himself. Now, you'll say if he's loyal, as he's loyal to one partner, okay, as you're talking about forever loyal. But remember, the Taylor looks at the whole thing as unhealthy because it's not the way God created us. And I'll talk about that more in coming weeks. It's not the way God created us. What does that mean? I know everyone's going to rise up in arms and say, what do you mean? Some people are just naturally born. They're just attracted to the same gender, just like you have brown eyes and blue eyes. Yeah, my point, however, is, even if a person has that natural tendency, God said, I created male and female. That's the way you will have children. That's where you'll build a family. This isn't just about sexuality. This is about the future. It's about how you build life in this world. So I understand that people have found all work workarounds. We can adopt children and so on. This is much more, the, the point here is much more, is, is all about sexuality, all about sexual attraction, whether you're attracted to the same gender or not the same gender. Even for heterosexual, from a third point of view, if your life is just about who you're attracted to, that's not life. Life is building a home and a family, building a mishkin, building a sacred world. That should be the focus. How you do it, so the Torah tells us how to do it. Now, if a person has a particular challenge, like in anything, just like a hot-blooded person may have certain challenges, a person who seems to be attracted to the same gender has their challenges. But if you're focused on the mission, why did your neshama come down this, to this world? It's not to, be, not to have sexual, sexual life. It's to have, to build a dira b'tachtenim. One of the ways to do it is to find a partner in life a sanctified partner, and build a family and home in that regard. Look at the Tate. Zohar Nekeva Bareis, and he created male and female, separated them, then they joined together, L'hoi L'bosarecha, with one flesh, Pruruvu, Milusa Aretz V'kivshua, to be fruitful and multiply, and fill the world and conquer it. Conquer it, L'ovdel L'shamra, to serve and protect, and turn it into a Mishkin, to turn it into a Dira a home for the divine. If that's the focus of your life, now we figure out how to do it. People have challenges. They have all kinds of challenges. Some people have physical handicaps. Some people have mental handicaps. Some people have emotional blockages. Some people have difficulty committing. People have trauma in their lives. Some people are attracted to the same gender. I'm not trying to put it into the same family. My point is, that's a challenge from a material point of view because that's not the way to fulfill your mission in this world. That's the question here, the mission. But instead, that's, what's doing, that's being replaced. The mission is being replaced. What I want. That's not what God sent you to this world, not to do what you want. Not, not heterosexual and not homosexual. That's not why we're here. We're here to do what God wants. We're here to fulfill our mission in life. And if there's a challenge, we deal with a challenge. Is there a way to work? You, there's always a way to work if you're committed to the cause. If you're in the military and this is your job 24-7, you know you must do this. You're an astronaut in space. You have to reach your mission, fulfill your mission. That should be the most important urgency. The problem is we indulge in different things. And again, I'm not saying there isn't a challenge involved. But it's a whole mindset that has to be looked at. Regarding your advice to a bacher about getting married, what about the girl in this case? So there I advised, get these things out of your head and go get married. And if you have a challenge, go to a therapist, go talk to someone. 
But what about the girl in this case? Is it right for a girl to enter a marriage with someone who's not truly attracted to her? Isn't that selling her short? So obviously the goal is that the bocha should be attracted to her and not fake it. I was speaking for him, it's he shouldn't stop himself from dating. He should date and work on himself to make sure that he can be in, a, in, a, in an honest relationship. Like I mentioned before. But even if a person, people are married and they sometimes have a machshav about another person. I'm not talking about male, male, even a male, female. People have, you walk in the street with your wife. You can love your wife and be attracted and you can have a, a negative thought. I'm not justifying it, but it happens. That doesn't end the world. You don't have to go share every thought you have just like you don't have to share every detail. The main thing is you don't act on it and you work on your relationship with your spouse. So I'm not suggesting a person who doesn't have completely sell someone short and lie. No. At some point you could even share if it's important. Not always important to share. But again, I would work on not just being stuck. This, this thing that people are being convinced that if you're gay, there's no way around that. And I'm not talking about conversion therapy. That's not what I'm advocating. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about sexuality is much more complicated than anyone knows. Every male has feminine tendencies. Every woman has male tendencies. It's a mix. We're more alike than we're different. There's different dominant genes. There are things that come from nature, things that come from nurture. Instead of starting with a subjective point that I want to know, what I, want, I have a pre, a pre, I already a pre-determined um, conclusion, and now I want to figure out how to justify it, let's start the other way around. What does God want from us? Let's start, what does God want from us and from you? And go with a clean slate. And then say, now I have a challenge to fulfill what God wants. That's the approach we should take. So if you're dating someone and you're having a challenge, don't think of it, oh, you know, this challenge is insurmountable. So what am I going to do? Fly to the girl? No, go work on it. Figure it out. I know personally there are people who were attracted to the same gender and with work, they didn't change their, their colors. They may still have those attractions, but they also are attracted to their wife and they've built beautiful families. Do they have nishenas? Do they have tests and challenges? Yes, they do. As, as who doesn't in this world? And I think we have to take that approach to the whole thing rather than this, with this zero-sum game. Okay, there's more to say on this, but time is limited. So I want to just cover, cover a few more topics, also follow up. A lot, a lot on the topic of narcissism, so I just want to cover that a bit. Okay, on the topic of narcissism, one of the big challenges is not being able to discuss anything thereby having what could be small issues built up instead of being resolved. How can one deal with this when, when any would-be discussion is cut off and everything is then suppressed for years? So it's part of the full discussion that I already discussed, which is you need to determine. If it's a dead end, you may have to come to a time of ultimatum. I must say that. If, if, it's not, if, if things are not getting better, it's destructive, and really no help, you may have to come down to real ultimatums and swallow the bullet and, and say tough things. If you feel you can manage it, and it's not destroying you and your children and the family, then even if it's not true, and meanwhile, you feel that way. I'm not suggesting staying there. That's why I think it's critical to have a third party that you can speak to and really be open with someone. If your spouse, who's the alleged narcissist, is not someone you can speak to, you have to speak to someone else put everything on the table and let them help you decide how to proceed. And look at all options, from the most lenient ones to the harshest ones. Because this is, again, life and death, and it could, be a big, uh, it, could be, it could have dire consequences one way or the other. There's a lot of talk about narcissism recently. We live in a narcissistic world where everything is me, 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 etc. But the term is taken out of context. What can be done when dealing with an individual who is a true narcissist? It seems like, unless one is directly associated and affected by one, and even then, only after many years, are people aware of what it actually is. For better or worse, I actually learned a lot about it on social media, but I so resonated with the traits and issues which I never thought were a thing. They do not apologize, don't take responsibility, shift all the blame on you, convince you that you are broken, damaged, the problem in all areas, get angry when presented with the truth, are a different face to you and to the world, etc., etc., how does one even begin to stand up for oneself while still wanting to keep the peace?
Okay, well, I, re- I just will repeat what I just said. Firstly, find someone to talk to. Lay it all out so you get it clear. It's validating. It's going to be affirming. And also add, add clarity. That person may provide some objective perspective, fresh air that you may not have heard one way or the other. They give you also courage and strength to make the right moves. And look at every possible option. Don't leave any stone unturned when it comes to this. It is a real challenge, a real plague, you can even call it. You have to really make a decision. But the decision should come from strength, not from weakness. Not because you're demoralized or because you've got that desperate. That may be the motivating factor. But your, your decision should come from strength, which means, no, you're doing it not because everything has failed. Because this is the right thing to do for me and my family. And that's why you want to do it not in an emotional moment. It should be calculated, well thought through. Look at all the pieces in place. Also anticipate what the spouse will do. And they can become very, very, of course, extremely, uh, more, much, much worse when, that, when, something, when you're confronted in that way. But you have to anticipate everything. And that's the best way to approach it. I don't really say more right now because I don't know all the details. If you want to talk more about it with me, please just write us at chassidusapply.com in the forum, but leave your email address, a place that we can respond to you, or if, without that, we don't have any way of contacting you. And with that, I'll, I'll, there's more to talk about. I see there are more key questions keep coming in, but I shall stop with that. But I want to conclude with Chaydash El, which is the opposite of narcissism. Union. Joining in both directions. I am to my beloved, my beloved to me. Both initiate. There's reciprocity, the exact opposite and antithetical everything we've just read and learned and discussed, I should say. So, in that, in that in mind, let us embrace Anila Day Day the energy of this month of love, unconditional love. And may it ultimately be fulfilled Anila Day 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 with the Abish to himself. Kachabricha and Knesset Sisro the total union, the nisuyin, the total marriage and joining will be, will be with the Gula Hamitis Vashlema. Everyone have a very good continue Chedeshel, Ksiv Vachsimatev, Lashonatev, Masuka, Begash, Misa, Beruchnias, all in good health and only Baruchas, Begolei, Betev, Hanira, Vanigla. And ultimately, even before the new year, Gula Hamitis Vashlema, which is also alluded to one of the Rosh Hashanahs of El. Where he, this has been my life because it is applied every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. Call Tuv and be well. This program is brought to you by My Life, Chassidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chassidusapplied.com slash donate.